Uh, I see we have a great crowd here. I'm pleased to um, announce that our speaker is Dr. Marty Jones for an encore presentation for us. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. <clears throat> Hopefully you guys were paying attention to the music as you walked in because I do have a door prize for the first person who can tell me what the name of that song was. Stardust. Stardust. That's exactly right. It's a song written by Hoagie Carmichael in 1927. I thought it was appropriate for the topic of today's talk. So it's a pretty interesting book if you've never read it before. It's uh, a book by Sam Keen uh, called The Disappearing Spoon. It's a treatment of the elements. It's uh, really interesting. If you've never seen a disappearing spoon before, just do a Google search and you can come up with a Google or uh, you can come up with a YouTube video that describes the disappearing spoon. I'm not going to give it away now. <coughs> I want to thank Dr. Nearing for the introduction and for letting me participate as part of the lunchtime talks in science and mathematics. A little disclaimer here. I am not an orator. If you were here last week for Dr. Crowther's presentation on Martin Luther King and the American Dream, you know what I'm talking about when I use the word orator. <laughs> if part of your American dream is to participate in space studies and space science, particularly as part of NASA, then please do as Dr. Nearing suggested and come hear Kobe Boykin's talk either to, uh, next Thursday at noon or next Thursday night in Carson Auditorium. If part of your American dream is space studies or space science without being an astronaut or an engineer, then perhaps this topic will be of some interest to you. We're going to first, for those of you who are not organic chemists, we're going to first go through a little bit of organic chemistry. Then we'll talk about molecules that are found in interstellar space, interplanetary dust particles, comets, meteorites, and we'll end up with a little bit of chirality and the abiotic versus biotic origin of organic materials. Chemistry 321 is the first semester of organic chemistry. And when I was teaching that, I would generally start the first class period of the fall semester by putting students in groups and asking them to discuss, then write on the board, what they think of when they hear the word organic. It was not uncommon for things on the board to appear like this. <coughs> Without the use of feed or fertilizer, so organic farming, organic produce. Um, but that's not what this talk is about. This talk is about organic chemistry, organic compounds, which contains carbon. So organic in this sense is the study of carbon containing materials. I'm going to give you just a few example organic compounds. This one is drawn in what is called a Lewis structure which shows all the atoms, all the bonds. The bonds are just indicated by these uh, lines. This is the compound ethanol. Many of you, no doubt, are familiar with ethanol, probably because of the gas hall that you might put in your automobile. <laughs> I suspect that many of you are not old enough to legally know or legally experience one of the other common uses <laughs> of ethanol. <laughs> but it is beverage alcohol or green alcohol, so if you have a margarita tonight um, while you're studying or while you're, <laughs> while you're reviewing for an exam or something, then think about that molecule. Drawing things in a Lewis formula or a Lewis structure is somewhat cumbersome. And we organic chemists tend to use instead condensed formulas and skeletal formulas. The condensed formula still includes all the atoms, but it doesn't explicitly show the bonds. It's faster to draw. And still, if you know the rules, it gives you the same information. 
here's a skeletal structure for that same material. Notice that we have just lines except for the OH group. So the end of a line represents a carbon, in this case with three hydrogens attached. And wherever there is a bend in the line, that's also a carbon, in this case with two hydrogens <coughs> attached. Now in organic chemistry, we talk about functional groups. These are characteristic arrangements of <coughs> atoms that confer physical and chemi uh, characteristic chemical and physical properties on things. The functional group that we have here is called an alcohol. A couple of other examples of organic molecules that might be of interest. I hope none of you has this molecule circulating in you right now. This is Oseltamivir, but you might know it better by its tree name of Tamiflu. So this is a material that's used in the treatment of flu symptoms. Um, a variety of different functional groups. This is a much more complex molecule. It contains nitrogens as well as oxygens. Most organic compounds uh, contain, well, all organic compounds contain carbon, but they can contain oxygen, nitrogen, halogens like fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and so on. Just a variety of different things. Here's another one that is of interest in particular to two states right now. <laughs> <coughs> what are the two states? Colorado and Washington. This is delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, the active ingredient or better known as THC, the active ingredient in marijuana. I, I hope, I trust that none of you have this circulating in your bloodstream right now either. All right, so where, from where does carbon come? By far the most abundant elements in the universe are hydrogen and helium. About 74% is hydrogen, 24% is helium. That leaves only 2% for the entire rest of the periodic table. Carbon is the fourth most abundant element. Oxygen is actually the third most abundant element. But it's still very, very small compared to hydrogen and helium. So from hydrogen comes from nuclear reactions, fusion <coughs> reactions of helium, three helium nuclei fused together to give a carbon-12 nucleus. All the other elements are formed in similar fashion, including different isotopes. For example, this looks different from this in that there's a 13 there instead of a 12. Those two carbons are isotopes of one another, which means that they have different numbers of neutrons. In order to be the same element, they must possess the same number of carbons, but they can have different numbers I'm sorry, the same number of protons, but they can have different numbers of neutrons. So this cascade of reactions just gives you an idea of some other nuclear chemistry reactions that can be used to produce different isotopes, different elements. The interstellar chemical environment is a lot different than the terrestrial chemical environment. For one thing, the two major energy sources in interstellar space are cosmic radiation and ultraviolet radiation from the stars. Unlike here on Earth, where we tend to think of thermal sources being the major energy source. Low temperature and a low density of reactants. I know that this winter has seemed pretty cold. I mean, it seemed pretty cold to me too, but it's downright balmy compared to interstellar space <laughs> where the temperatures are, for the most part, less than 20 Kelvin. And because space is primarily a vacuum, there's not molecules close to one another. And all this means is that reactions that occur in space are controlled not by thermodynamics, that is how stable molecules are, but instead controlled by kinetics, how rapidly molecules can react with one another. <coughs> so now we finally get to see some organic molecules that have, I, that have been found in space, in the interstellar medium. It's a variety of things, 
including some simple hydrocarbons like methane and ethylene. This is considered a saturated molecule because it has as many bonds to carbon as it can possess. This one is considered an unsaturated molecule because of the presence of a double bond. It is not completely saturated with carbon or with hydrogens. We have some oxygenated species. Alcohols have been found in interstellar space. This is a molecule that possesses a functional group called an ether. We have aldehydes and ketones, carboxylic acids. There are nitrogen-containing species like nitriles and amines, and even some simple amino acids. This is the amino acid glycine. Lest you think that all the molecules found in interstellar space are very small, there have been identified some polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. These are condensed aromatic rings. They're fairly good size, not huge, but fairly good size. Uh, some of you are probably familiar with fullerenes, things like Buckmin Buckminster fullerene or carbon nanotubes, things of that sort. In 2010, the NASA Spitzer Infrared Telescope picked up a characteristic infrared signature from uh, the, the dust around a star 6,500 light years away, corresponding that to the fullerenes. So these are found in interstellar space as well. Finally, Although these last two are not considered to be organic compounds, they are found in interstellar space, and I've included them here for a reason, which you will see in just a few minutes. <coughs> these molecules form primarily through ion molecule reactions rather than typical kinds of reactions that you might associate with a terrestrial formation to neutral molecules coming together. Instead, cos cosmic rays are considered ionizing radiation. And so it's entirely possible for a cosmic ray to strike a hydrogen molecule, kick out an electron, and create a hydrogen ion, H2+, plus, which could then react with <coughs> neutral hydrogen to form this H3+. Plus. <coughs> And as you go through this sequence of events, you can see how small molecules can form. And it would be the rest of the talk to go through to see how polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons could come with very large numbers of atoms. But this gives a sense of how things like methanol can form. This is methylformate and ester. Um, and you get a sense that these are a fairly complex series of events that occur in order to form organic species. But you have to consider that the Big Bang occurred, what is it, like 4.6 or 4.8 billion years ago? A long time ago. Even though these species are far apart, given that length of time, they certainly can collide with one another to create organic species. Some of the more interesting topics dealing with organic compounds are when we talk about objects and the organic molecules that are found as part of objects rather, just, rather than just in the interstellar medium. <coughs> we'll begin with uh, interplanetary dust particles. which are typically very small, less than 50 microns in size. And they're in two categories, anhydrous and hydrous. That is without water and with water. The anhydrous particles tend to contain minerals like pyroxene and olivine. They're thought to be of cometary origin. Hydrous uh, dust particles are uh, likely of asteroid origin, and they're distinguished because they contain different types of clay minerals. 
both types can contain up to about 90% of carbon by weight. Uh, both aliphatic and aromatic compounds can be present. Functional groups typically include more highly oxidized materials like ketones, carboxylic acids, and there are, uh, is also nitrogen present in some of the dust particles. Um, certainly not all interplanetary dust particles are the same. If you do a Google search for images of interplanetary or interstellar dust particles, this is one that you might find, um, which is interplanetary dust particle L2054E1. <laughs> and I have to look at my notes to see where this, this I think was collected in 2003 <coughs> by a NASA aircraft. So this, this was not something that came by NASA flying a mission to outer space and collecting it. An aircraft flew through a dust plume from the comet 26P slash Greg Skellerup <laughs> and collected these uh, particles. And you can see that this one probably belongs to the anhydrous, which we said was of cometary origin, because it contains olivine. And these little inclusions that are circled here, and I know it's kind of hard to pick it out, are where the organic matter uh, has come from. So very small particles that can contain carbon as well as <coughs> mineral matter. Late one night when the wind was still. Let me turn this down for just a minute here. Daddy brought the baby to the window sill. <coughs> These little pebbles should have crossed the sky. Comets are <coughs> fragments <coughs> that come from either the Oort cloud, if they have a long period, or from the Kuiper belt, if they have a small, a smaller, shorter period. So this song is about Halley's Comet. It's by Mary Chapin Carpenter. And here's a picture of Halley's Comet. Halley's Comet is one that comes from the Kuiper belt because it has a period of about 76 years or there are 75 to 76 years. Small molecules like methane, ethane, methanol, formaldehyde, ethanol are identified in the comet dust surrounding these. And this is the so-called Stardust mission from NASA. This flew close to Comet Wild within like 140 miles of Comet Wild back in 2004. It returned to Earth with all the samples and they, when those samples were analyzed, one of the things they found in the comet dust was this, glycine. By far the greatest work in terms of volume of work, and perhaps most interesting, certainly most interesting to me, on organic molecules from space has been done using meteorites. Meteorites uh, come from a belt between Mars and Jupiter. They're thought to be fragments of asteroids that simply did not coalesce after the Big Bang. There's enough space between Mars and Jupiter that a planet would fit but instead, what we have are these asteroid belts. So the meteor showers that we see, fragments of asteroids coming uh, out of the orbit between Mars and Jupiter. There are three categories, three major categories, the iron meteorites, which are mostly iron and nickel, the stony meteorites, and the stony iron meteorites. <laughs> I didn't make these up. <laughs> <coughs> these all look kind of like terrestrial rocks. You know, you have to be Johnny on the spot in order to either identify the meteorite or be close by when a meteorite comes to Earth so that you can go find it right away. Now, in the stony meteorites, 
See these little shiny areas here? Those are little inclusions that are called chondrules. And if the chondrules contain significant amounts of carbon, then they are called carbonaceous chondrites. So this is a subcategory of the stony meteorites. And it's the carbonaceous chondrites that really have provided the bulk of the information in terms of what organic molecules can be formed in space. We're going to look at two of them in a bit more detail. <coughs> One of them is called the Murchison meteorite, which fell to Earth in 1969 near Murchison, Australia. It's in the state of Victoria, here in the very southeastern part of Australia. Pretty desert environment, not very inhabited. The town of Murchison is, has fewer than 3,000 people. And here's a picture of a fragment from the Murchison meteorite. You know, I'm, I'm certainly not a geologist, so I will defer to Dr. Benson. But <laughs> to me, you know, if I were walking along up in the mountain somewhere and passed by that, I would not think, oh, there's a meteorite. I better pick it up. <laughs> but I better put on gloves first to pick it up. But I don't know. I, you know I, what do you think, Rob? I don't know, given how many people try and bring faux meteorites to me. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> ah, well, I don't have any to show you. So. Yeah. A, a second one that has also been pretty significantly studied is the Tagish Lake meteorite. This fell to Earth on the <coughs> frozen surface of Tagish Lake in the year 2000. So it's a newer meteorite than the Murchison meteorite. Tagish Lake is up here on the border between the Yukon and British Columbia. Again, a very sparsely inhabited place. And because it fell on a frozen surface. It was surrounded by ice and should be in pretty pristine condition. Notice that the gentleman who's picking this up has gloves on. Perhaps that's because it's cold, but <laughs> also all reports seem to indicate that whoever found this meteorite knew what they were doing and knew how to be careful to collect the meteorite. That will become important in a few minutes. Here's just another picture of a fragment of the Tagish Lake meteorite outside its ice shell. These meteorites are stored carefully, handled very carefully, because you wanted to avoid terrestrial contamination. So both of these are examples of carbonaceous chondrites, which can contain significant amount of water, up to 20%, for example, of the composition could be water. The organic compounds are typically closely associated with clay minerals. That will become important. And of the carbon containing material present, about 70% of it is insoluble organic matter. Now, typically when we think of soluble versus insoluble, we think of soluble in water versus insoluble in water. But it, this doesn't necessarily mean that. Certainly that's one of the solvents to be employed, but other solvents include <coughs> nonpolar solvents like toluene and chloroform, polar organic solvents like acetone, <coughs> methanol, ethanol, even dilute solutions of acids and bases have been used. So when I use the term insoluble organic matter, that really means that it's not soluble in any common solvent you would use in a laboratory. <coughs> Based on solid NMR work, infrared work, decomposition studies involving pyrolysis and oxidation, this is a proposed structure for the insoluble organic matter. You can see that it consists of these polycyclic aromatic rings here, here. In some cases, they're heterocyclic. That means they have a nitrogen or a sulfur present. <coughs> and there are different groups bridging these aromatic 
inclusions like ethers, sulfides, alkyl ketones, and so on. So a pretty complex structure. It's interesting when you consider this insoluble organic material that it bears some similarity to the structure, to a proposed structure of coal. Now coal didn't come from outer space. Coal is an insoluble organic material that's referred to as a kerogen, but kerogens have a biological origin. The insoluble organic matter from a meteorite does not have a biologic origin. But notice the presence of these polycyclic aromatic rings, sulfide bridges, ether bridges, presence of ketones and carboxylic acids, and so on. A similar type of material, and coal is certainly insoluble in uh, common organic solvents as well. <coughs> this table is taken from a 2007 report from the National Research Council, the Task Force on Organic Environments in the Solar System. So it was published in 2007, but the work on writing the report actually started much earlier than that, uh, sometime in the early 2000s. So it's a little dated, but what it does illustrate is that there's a pretty significant diversity of organic compounds in these meteorites. Hydrocarbons, carboxylic acids, amino acids, amines, heterocycles, and so on. Notice that the Tagish Lake meteorite and the Murchison meteorite are not the same. They don't contain exactly the same materials. There seems to be a greater diversity of compounds in the Murchison meteorite, almost 400 different compounds at the time of that report, uh, and only about 60 or so out of the Tagish Lake meteorite. It's not just the diversity, it's also the, uh, the number of typical species. Look at this, 74 different amino acids have been isolated from the Murchison meteorite. Now, those of us who are organic or biochemists tend to think of amino acids as the 20 common amino acids that are used to make proteins, or at least I do. That's way more than 20. Okay. So some of these must be amino acids that have structures unlike those that we typically find here on Earth. And we'll get to that in just a minute. Also notice that the Murchison meteorite contains some nitrogen heterocycles. So in a 2010 paper from Arizona State, <coughs> analysis of nine different samples from the Murchison meteorite by Fourier transform ion cyclotron resonance slash mass spectrometry, which is a pretty fancy tool, fairly recent analytical uh, material, suggests that there may actually be more than 14,000 different organic molecules in the Murchison meteorite. They have not, the structures have not all been identified yet because they're working with very small samples. And so uh, there's just not enough information yet to put actual structures to the number of compounds. But from molecular formula and statistical analysis, this is what is proposed, more than 14,000 different organics. Well, <coughs> of particular interest are the amino acids and the nitrogen heterocycles. So these amino acids in the Murchison meteorite include these eight and 66 others. But these are amino acids that we find here in our bodies. Glycine, alanine, proline, valine, leucine, isoleucine, aspartic acid, and glutamic acid. <laughs> Another one that is found in the Murchison meteorite is isovaline. Notice that it differs from valine in that a methyl group has moved over to the alpha position in isovaline. The lack of a hydrogen at this carbon 
is an important consideration when we talk about the uh, activity of this amino acid. Again, even though eight of these are found in the body, of the remaining 66, not counting isovaline, the rest are not found in the human body. And the remaining 12 that are found in the body were not found in the Murchison meteorite. So there is no lysine, for example, in the Murchison meteorite or histidine or other common amino acids. Pretty interesting set of compounds. And one might wonder how are these amino acids formed. In the laboratory, there is a technique called the Strucker amino acid synthesis, which involves taking an aldehyde, adding in a nucleophilic addition reaction ammonia and hydrogen cyanide to give a cyanoamine, and then hydrolysis under acidic conditions of the nitrile group gives a carboxylic acid. Well, let's see, what are some of the molecules that are found what are some of the functional groups that are found in interstellar space? Were aldehydes on that list? Yes, they were. A simple molecule called ac acryl aldehyde. Was ammonia and hydrogen cyanide on the list? Was water a part of carbonaceous chondrites? What about an acid? Anything in those chondrites that could function as an acid? <laughs> yes, I thought I knew, I knew I heard that. Somebody <laughs> said yes. Clay minerals, for example, things like montmorillonite clay can function as Lewis acid catalysts. And we've used them before in the labs uh, up on the third floor for acidic catalysts. So all the components necessary for the Strucker amino acid synthesis are present in those carbonaceous chondrites. This suggests then that the amino acids found in the carbonaceous chondrites are products of parent body synthesis, that is synthesized in the meteorite or on the surface of the meteorite, not a consequence of falling to earth and then the synthesis occurring after it's already fallen to earth. Nitrogen heterocycles. Among those found in the Murchison meteorite are xanthine and hypoxanthine. But of more interest is adenine and guanine and uracil. These last three are all a part of nucleic acids in life forms on Earth. Adenine and guanine are in both RNA and DNA. Uracil is found only in RNA. So, molecules that we associate with living organisms on Earth have been found in these meteorites. That begs the question, though, uh, how do we know for sure that they are abiotic in origin or extraterrestrial rather than contaminated by careless handling or... Uh, falling to earth and getting uh, soil adhering to it or things of that sort. <clears throat> well, the scientists who do this work have come up with some guidelines that allow you to discern whether the material is of biotic or abiotic origin. For example, one of those guidelines is a smooth distribution of organic compounds in a sample. Let's take, for example, carboxylic acids. We have in our bodies and other life forms as well, molecules called fatty acids. These are long chain carboxylic acids that contain even numbers of carbon atoms based on their biosynthesis. So C10, C12, C14, 16, 18, and so on. If a sample, a suite of carboxylic acids from a meteorite contains odd as well as even numbers of carbon atoms, that suggests that it is not of biotic origin because 
it's not being comprised or it's not being synthesized just by building up two carbon precursors. The presence of all possible structures, patterns, isomers, and stereoisomers in a subset of compounds. <coughs> and again, this kind of pertains to the amino acids. We know there are 20 common ones. Think of the Murchison meteorite, 74 different amino acids. That's a lot of them that we don't have in our bodies. Again, indicating an abiotic source. Ratios of isotopes. On Earth, we have a pretty good handle in life forms of the ratio of the isotope carbon-13 to carbon-12, deuterium to hydrogen, nitrogen-15 to nitrogen-14. There's a pretty narrow range, and if the isotope values, the isotope ratios for a sample from a meteorite is different than that normal range, then we can say it's probably not been contaminated by earthly samples. And finally, a balance of observed enantiomers. We're going to spend a little more time talking about this because some of you may not be familiar with what I mean by enantiomers. It all stems from the topic of chirality. Chirality is a word that comes from the Greek word hand. So what I'd like for you to do right now is just to hold your hands up. You can either have them face you or face away from you, but hold them up so your two hands are separated from one another. Would you say, let's see, Melody, would you say that your hands are mirror images of one another? Yes. Yes. Larry, would you say that your hands are mirror images of one another? Yes. Now, I want you to overlap them. Do they match up point for point? No. 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 They do not superimpose on one another. <coughs> and chiral materials, chiral <laughs> objects, like your hands, are said to be chiral because their mirror images do not overlap with one another. The term that we use for that is superimpose. An Erlenmeyer flask, on the other hand, is an achiral material because you can certainly take these two mirror images and overlap them, superimpose them one over the other. There's a variety of chiral and achiral objects. You can look at your shoes. Those should be chiral <laughs> objects. What about socks? Are socks chiral? Only depends upon, yes, if they are toe socks, but we're not talking about toe socks here. Well, we could be. It's good that you make that distinction. What about a nail? Is a nail a chiral object? A nail that you hammer into a board. No. What about a screw? Yes, a screw is a chiral object because its mirror image would have the threads going the opposite direction, right? So there's a variety of chiral objects in nature. <coughs> and fortunately for us, there are also chiral molecules. Here is a representation of a pair of so-called enantiomers. We use the term enantiomer to represent chiral molecules, that is, Molecules whose mirror images cannot be superimposed upon one another. This atom at the center is bonded to four different groups in a tetrahedral arrangement. So imagine this to be a carbon and four different groups bonded to it. These two mirror images cannot be superimposed on one another. Here's an example of an amino acid, L-alanine and D-alanine. The L and the D refer to the orientations of these groups. Notice that there are four different groups surrounding this central carbon. That means that alanine is a chiral molecule. And in life forms on Earth, the L form of the amino acids is predominant. 
So isovaline, an amino acid not found as part of normal living things. Here is the structure once again. Notice the lack of a hydrogen here. There is an enantiomeric excess favoring the L form of isovaline in the Murchison meteorite, depending upon the sample, the range from 0 to 15 percent. Now, enantiomeric excess is simply defined, <coughs> the L enantiomeric excess is the percentage of the L isomer minus the percentage of the D isomer. So <coughs> an enantiomeric excess of 10 percent would mean 55 percent in the L form, 45 percent in the D form. Still a significant amount of both amino acids. That Strecker synthesis that I showed you before produces a racemic mixture that is an equal amount of both the L and the D forms. The question then becomes if the Strecker amino acid synthesis is correct for how amino acids are synthesized in meteorites, how is it that we have any sort of an L enantiomeric excess? Here's just another view. I <coughs> I probably spend too much time Googling images, but, <laughs> but I thought this was pretty cute because we've got the Murchison meteorite and the two different, the L and the D forms of isovaline. Well, there's, there are some proposals. Well, actually, let, let me move to the next slide first, and then we'll come back to how you might get an enantiomeric excess. Because what's more striking is two amino acids that are found both in the Murchison meteorite and the Tagish Lake meteorite. <clears throat> this is aspartic acid, this is glutamic acid. In the Tagish Lake meteorite, enantiomeric excesses of 40 to nearly 60 percent have been observed. And this is done by chiral chromatography <laughs> coupled with mass spectrometry. So even at, let's say, 40 percent, we're talking about 70% of the L isomer versus 30% of the D isomer. So still a pretty significant amount of D isomer. But again, if the Strecker synthesis yields a racemic mixture, how do you get enriched in one over the other? There's a couple possibilities that have been put forward. One is a selective decomposition of one enantiomer by absorption of what is called ultraviolet circularly polarized light. That would be out in the interstellar medium. The light shining down on the meteorite could possibly cause that. But some experiments on Earth have indicated that enrichments probably less than 10% are possible using UV circularly polarized light. That certainly does not explain this relatively large enantiomeric excess in glutamic acid and aspartic acid. So another postulate <clears throat> is that a selective crystallization process favors one form over the other. Now both of these have a hydrogen at this carbon adjacent to the amino group here. And that hydrogen, under appropriate catalysts, can be removed. And when it gets removed, it forms a planar intermediate, which can then revert or invert its stereochemistry. So the L form can be converted into the D form and vice versa. If under crystallization conditions with appropriate catalysts present, perhaps those clay minerals, perhaps the selective racemization or epimerization, I'm sorry, can occur to favor this L enantiomeric form. So we have amino acids and we have nitrogen heterocycles in these carbonaceous meteorites. There have been some even more recent studies which suggest the presence of polyols perhaps simple sugars as well. All of these are materials that are found on Earth in life forms. So the question then becomes, is this related to the origin of life in any fashion? It is not a new topic. 
probably even farther back than Berzelius's time in the early 1800s, a theory put forward called, <clears throat> excuse me, called panspermia, which suggested that life forms were brought to Earth. Um, Lord Kelvin, in an address to the British Association for the Advancement of Science, suggested that the germs of life might have been brought to Earth by some meteorite. Now, in the truest sense, panspermia, as proposed by Berzelius and Kelvin and Arrhenius, meant that already existing life just caught a ride on a meteorite or on comet dust, and when it impacted the Earth, there, life was present. It's not likely that that was really the case, and panspermia is no longer considered to be a viable theory, or at least not by most scientists, because what has been found in these carbonaceous chondrites and the dust particles are monomeric species, amino acids, nitrogen heterocycles, perhaps some simple building blocks that could be used to create the 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 homochiral polymers that we know as the nucleic acids and proteins. So perhaps the materials which were necessary for the beginning of life were brought to Earth by meteorites and dust particles, but it's highly unlikely that any life forms themselves. So far, nothing has been discovered to indicate that life forms themselves hitched a ride on a meteorite and came to Earth and started life. Hydrothermal vents in the ocean, high temperature, high pressure, have been shown to promote polymerization reactions, condensation reactions, just the types of reactions that are necessary for these biopolymers to form. So it's conceivable that these monomeric materials under the right conditions could have begun to condense to form molecules that we associate with life, but it's not likely that life actually came from meteorites. So where do we go from here? <coughs> Sky is the limit. <laughs> the problem is the number of samples because there's just not that many. And you have to be extraordinarily careful when you're getting these samples. If you're collecting them yourself, you have to be certain that you don't contaminate them. If you buy them from a collector, which has been proposed, one of the recommendations of the National Research Council is, you know, as much as you might not like having to spend money to purchase a private collector's sample of a meteorite, that may be one of the ways that they can be uh, obtained. That may be one of the few ways to be obtained. So if you're a geologist, pay attention when your instructors tell you about meteorites. Try to get familiar with how to identify a meteorite. Pay attention when Dr. Astalos sends out the little reminders about the Perseid meteor shower and so on. Find places where those might land and fall to earth and go out and very carefully collect some. And then, of course, because you're all truistic, you would not collect them for yourself and sell them, but rather donate them to a museum or a university so that further study could be done. <clears throat> so more samples are needed for further analysis. We need additional analyses of where these organic molecules are how many there are, what, what kinds of materials are present. With the newer techniques available for analyses, we can do this. The insoluble organic matter is still not very clearly identified. What I showed you was just a proposed structure, but it's certainly not nailed down. And lastly, with every sample, you need to do an isotopic uh, composition analysis so that you know that it hasn't been contaminated by terrestrial sources. <clears throat> so it's amazing the information that you can find on this topic. 
Uh, we have a few of these. The Biological Universe and the Fallen Sky are two books that we have in our library, or they will be back in the library when I return them. <laughs> <coughs> if you've never read this book, A Short History of Nearly Everything by Bill Bryson, I can heartily recommend it. It's a very interesting book. And these are all available either through our library on the eBrary or um, through just signing up. I didn't have to pay anything for any of these articles and was able to download full text version PDFs. So we're going to end with one more piece of music here. I'm going to turn it up a little bit. You should recognize this. I have one more door prize for whoever can identify, whoever can tell me the name of this song. What? Okay, see if you can catch this. <laughs> this is Woodstock. I don't have a door prize, but do you, does anybody know who wrote this song? Joni Mitchell wrote the song. This is the version. Why did I choose this song? Right, exactly. Sorry, I don't have any more door prizes.